The state of Maine is home to about 1.3 million people. It is said that Maine is one of the happier and safer places to live. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily the case for some of Maine's smaller inhabitants. Vernal pools or seasonal woodland pools are ephemeral wetlands that fill with spring rains and oft times dry by summer's end. They can occur in many different settings. As shrub swamps, they can be what you call marshes. They can be a pool in a bigger wetland, perhaps in a forested wetland. Another key characteristic of vernal pools is they're not connected to permanent water bodies such as lakes and rivers. So vernal pools can occur in many different landscape settings, including floodplains and in depressions that collect water. These depressions may be connected to the groundwater system or they may be fed just by rainwater and runoff during rain events. My agency, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, actually has a very broad mandate. It's to protect all of the fish and wildlife of the state and the ecosystems upon which the wildlife depend. Well, one of the newest habitats that meets all of criteria in that it has a diversity of species and is a very high concentration of species during a critical portion of their life history is vernal pools. And especially a subset of the vernal pool universe, if you will, these high value, what we call significant vernal pools, where we get exceptional concentrations of either rare or uh, just very high numbers of the indicator species. In Maine, vernal pools are defined by the four indicator species that breed in them, wood frogs, blue spotted and spotted salamanders, and fairy shrimp. Fairy shrimp are the freshwater version of brine shrimp or sea monkeys. Fairy shrimp have a very short life cycle, up to six weeks, so they can survive in pools that might not even produce wood frogs or salamanders who need that three to five month period. Fairy shrimp can grow up to an inch in length. They swim upside down, filtering plankton through their feathery appendages. A female will carry her eggs in a brood pouch until the end of her life, at which time the eggs are released. So the eggs overwinter on the edges of the pool, and as the pool refills in the spring, the eggs will hatch and the young shrimp will swim around and develop all within six weeks. Wood frogs, salamanders, and fairy shrimp are largely dependent on vernal pools for successful breeding because these pools dry up, thereby excluding permanent fish populations. Therefore, vernal pools provide a unique aquatic habitat for a number of amphibians and invertebrates that do not compete well with fish and other predators associated with permanent waters. Sometime in October and November, when temperatures start cooling, the wood frogs will move to their winter habitat, so they leave the forested wetlands and go to well-drained uplands where they will hibernate just beneath the leaf litter in a small depression. Wood frogs have the ability to freeze 60 to 70 percent of their body, so they actually become froxicles beneath the leaf litter in the winter. It's very important that there's adequate snow cover because although wood frogs are adapted for freezing a large percentage of their body, they can't endure temperatures negative four degrees for long periods of time. Very unique about vernal pools is their ability to transform huge amounts of organic material from the surrounding forest into the biomass and flesh of these indicator species, which are then moving hundreds, even thousands of feet out into the surrounding forest ecosystem, where they become uh, part of the food chain for more conspicuous species that we're all more familiar with. Mammals and coyotes and raccoons and raptors and uh, skunks and uh, herons and snakes, some of the larger species that we care about or that we're more familiar with. In early spring, after spring rains have come and the snow has started to melt and the ice is coming off the pools, vernal pools are often deafeningly noisy with wood frog choruses. The wood frog males come to the pool first and they're chorusing to attract the females. The females will come to the pool and there will be what's called an explosive breeding event where male wood frogs will breed with anything that moves. The wood frogs will lay their eggs in colonial masses because they all breed at the same time. Often wood frogs don't reproduce until they're two years old. 
and since they live only three to five years, they're very intent on breeding when they do make it to a breeding pool. And this is why we call them explosive breeders. Unlike the wood frogs, which you remember are explosive breeders, salamanders may take up to six weeks to deposit all of their eggs. Most salamanders overwinter in small mammal burrows. They're often shrew burrows, and they don't emerge until melting snow and warm spring rains trickle into these winter refuges. Because salamanders may live 10 to 20 years, they don't necessarily breed every year. But when males do reach the pools, they deposit sperm packets, or spermatophores, on twigs or on the pool bottom. Male and female salamanders may engage in a courtship dance before the female takes up a sperm packet. This courtship dance, called a congress, may involve a few individuals or even hundreds. Large breeding events of wood frogs and salamanders are known by amphibian enthusiasts as big night. And this is a wildlife spectacle that doesn't require traveling very far from home. So in July, August, and September, the amphibians that were raised in these pools will leave the pools and disperse into the surrounding forest, providing food for a lot of animals. It's important to keep in mind that just as deer wintering areas provide habitat for a lot more species than just white-tailed deer, similarly, significant vernal pools, these high-value concentration uh, vernal pool areas, provide habitat for a very diverse assemblage of wetland-associated species. So, for example, the carnivores are actually targeting the amphibians as they move in and out of the pools. Things like uh, deer and moose can be found early in the spring eating some of the fresh greenery that greens up in these areas before as the snow melts more quickly there than it does in the surrounding woods. There's actually a lot of wildlife that will use this habitat um, at, at different times of the year and so by focusing on the indicator species it does help us uh, hone in our definition on identifying uh, what is a high-value vernal pool, but it's important to keep in mind that they are just that. They're indicators of a functioning ecosystem that's providing habitat for a, a much larger diversity of species. I'm standing in the middle of a completely dry vernal pool, and this several months ago, at the end of March, uh, the water was up above, completely up almost to the fences. Now it is completely dry, and the metamorph salamanders are moving out of the pool depression. Kevin is working on the, the blue spotted in Connecticut and we're putting little pit tags which are like those things at the supermarket. That little coil charges the microchip and it emits a frequency which gives a unique code. And he, then he lets them go and then he goes with this thing that looks like a vacuum cleaner and sweeps the ground looking for where they've settled. So we've got transects emanating from this pool sweeping the ground to find out density, what types of habitats they settle in. Uh, so there's some interesting new technologies coming out that are, that are going to help us with tracking these animals. With our research project on the blue spotted salamander, we're not only looking at the breeding characteristics through pitfall trapping, but we're looking at overall habitat use. Ah, we have a blue spot in there. That we will keep. So we're going to collect this metamorph salamander and bring it back to the lab and give it what's known as a batch mark, uh, a unique color code of an elastomer dye that's injected just, just beneath the skin uh, at the base of the tail, which will, in future years, if we recapture this animal, uh, we'll know that since he was marked with the color that we have designated for this wetland, we'll know where, where he or she came from. I record what's captured and release it on the opposite side of the fence in which it was captured as that's its presumed direction of travel. It's a pretty big unknown in amphibian ecology, this period of post-metamorphosis just dispersal for juveniles. And it's an important life stage because it's, it's thought to be the dispersing life stage. Very often adult amphibians will come back to the same pool to breed from year to year. But it's the young of the year um, the juveniles that frequently disperse to new breeding pools. So there's this period of two plus years where they're in the upland landscape, these juvenile frogs, before they reach reproductive maturity. And so we don't really know what they're doing, what their habitat use is, how they're moving, and the distances between breeding and natal pools. So far we know that you know, they love forest, they hate clear cut. The 20 year old regeneration um, acted as good habitat for these animals. 
And then the more interesting uh, result was that the 11-year-old regeneration, which was actually a, a coniferous stand that acted uh, as a partial bar barrier to movements and acted the same way as a recent clear-cut would. I'm also interested in looking at, at other kinds of complex landscapes too that might also um, be more typical of what we see in towns. In addition to forestry practices, what about um, urban structures associated with urbanization, lawns, pavement, pastures, agricultural settings, because in reality a lot of these, these pools aren't really in a vacuum surrounded always by contiguous forest or certain kinds of forestry practices. Oftentimes they're embedded in landscapes that have more complex land uses.